Hey, I'm Nico from Licks of the Beast, and in this episode, we're gonna talk about a truly awesome deep cut from Iron Maiden's Somewhere in Time album, the fantastically titled The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. The reason I wanted to talk about this song in particular is that there was talk before the current Future Past tour started that Steve Harris had said they were considering the possibility of playing it live. Now, I thought it sounded like a fun idea to entertain, but ultimately something that was highly unlikely to happen. And as it turns out, my suspicions were correct, and it was not included in the current set list. But that doesn't mean we can't have a closer look at it here. Just a quick note before I go on. Now, I want to mention that if you like what I do here, I now have a second channel called Nico's Guitar World, where I will explore many of the same topics, but for a variety of different artists and with more focus on the guitar. Now, I have a long road ahead to build and develop that channel, so it would mean so much to me if you could go over there and subscribe to that one as well. If you're passionate about music beyond Iron Maiden, I'm sure you're going to love that content. I will link to my first full video both in the description and in the end screen at the end of this video. Like the other seven songs on the album, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner is so unique, both musically and lyrically, that it could only exist on Somewhere in Time. And that's one of the things I really love about it. So, for those of you who don't know, this song is based on a short story by English writer Alan Silito that was published in 1959. Without getting into any of the political overtones, the basic plot is a teenager named Smith, who's kind of disconnected from society, gets caught robbing a bakery, and then gets sent to an institution for delinquent youths. He also happens to be good at long-distance running, as it helps him think more clearly. And when the higher-ups at the school notice, they want him to represent that institution against the prestigious public school in a big upcoming race. If he wins, he's gonna have it easy for the rest of his time there. Yada yada yada, he agrees to race, but as he gets to the finish line, he defiantly stops and lets the others cross ahead of him. So for throwing the race, the remainder of his time is made even more difficult. But Smith is fine with this because his dignity and independence are more important. Now that you know what the song is about, let's get to the music. One quick thing I will say before starting to look at the song part by part is that although the song is inspired by an older short story set in a rather bleak past, the music here conveys the exhilaration of running and glorifies the greatness of the human spirit without trying to capture the context of the original story that inspired it. And this is very consistent with the theme of looking towards the future despite our difficult past that permeates the entirety of Somewhere in Time. The beautifully atmospheric intro builds slowly as it goes along. So let's look at what each individual instrument is doing, starting with Steve Harris's octave figure which highlights the chords E, C, D, E, and D. Next, they play the same thing, only moved up one and a half steps to the key of G minor. So the implied chords are now G, E flat, F, G, and F again. Meanwhile, Dave Murray is playing suspended second chords with a clean tone. And Adrian Smith plays the main melody based on the natural minor scale. Now his tone here is really cool because it's kind of an edge of breakup tone with the volume down a little. But it has a glassy quality to it, almost like he's in position 2 on an HSS strat, except I think it's just a humbucker with the volume down a little. There is of course a fair bit of chorus and a nice reverb that gives the intro a very dreamy feel. Meanwhile, Nico is playing a 16th note pattern on the hi-hat alone. Mm -hmm. 
They then repeat this once more but with a slightly different feel and Nico now adds in some snare hits to slowly increase the intensity. And it's really neat how the snare falls on the 2 and the 4 of the first measure of the melody and then on the second measure it's on the 2 and on the upbeats of 3 and 4. Dave switches from clean sus 2 chords to power chords with a high gain sound and he slides slowly between each chord to create a sense of friction and intense buildup. And Adrian keeps playing the same thing as on the first half, but with the volume all the way up for a more gainy sound. From there the song speeds up by about 25 beats per minute into the first verse. And this is probably the closest Maidens ever got to full on power metal. They are now in the key of D minor and the guitars are playing this really cool gallop pattern. The tail of that part is partially harmonized as Adrian plays it the way I just demonstrated. And Dave starts it a third lower, like this. The vocal line pretty much follows the guitars and bass throughout. The verse ends with a longer tail and that leads to the pre-chorus with a ringing power chord, which is a great thing to do after a tight verse so that the song breathes a little. But only the first chord in the pattern rings out. The rest is made up of moving chords so that it's not a drastic change from the verse. So we were back in E minor for 4 bars and then modulated up a step to F sharp minor for the next 4. Steve Harris's bass line follows the chords as does Bruce's vocal melody. Now this is similar to what they did in the verses of Aces High except here the bass is following note for note as well. That takes us back to the verse and the pre-chorus again and then we get to the chorus. Now the rhythm pattern here is made up exclusively of heavily syncopated eighth notes as the chords go from D to B flat to C to F. They play this twice, once with both guitarists playing the chords in unison and then again with Adrian adding this really cool line on top. What's really neat about this is that it's played in straight eighth notes the whole way through but the pattern is in groups of threes. So you have this rhythmic displacement thing going on where the pattern ends up starting on a different beat with each iteration. And this creates a really interesting tension that builds continuously until the end of the chorus. After the first chorus we get this really great instrumental section that starts with two back-to-back -back interludes, a bridge and two guitar solos before going back to the verse. The first interlude features a simple four note melody harmonized in thirds and played first over a D and then over a C. Now this is a cool technique to use because it makes the melody feel like it's moving all while keeping things simple enough for the listener to just let their mind float. Adrian plays the low melody
and Dave plays the high melody. And Steve plays just the notes D and C as straight eighth notes underneath. After playing this twice, they add a little break with this roll on a B flat chord before picking up the melody again. The second interlude that follows comes with a key change from D minor to E minor and a new slower, dreamier melody over a tight, syncopated staccato rhythm, which is the opposite of the first interlude that had a busier melody over a smooth, flowing rhythm. Once again, Adrian plays the low melody. Dave plays the high melody. And Steve and Nico play a tight rhythm pattern like this. This rhythm continues into the bridge where Bruce sings the I've got to keep running part. The chords remain the same as well, the only difference is that they change faster. That takes us to Adrian and Dave's brilliant guitar solos. Both are highly memorable with impeccable phrasing and an astounding sense of melody, pacing and feel. The way they complement one another is a very special thing that really sets these two apart as far as lead guitar duos go. Now, I've covered both solos in a recent video which I will link to both the description and the end screen of this video. But I'll quickly go over them lick by lick here and I'll do it a little bit slower so that you can get a better sense of what's being played. So, for Adrian's solo, they modulate from the key of E minor to the relative G major. However, the solo is mostly based on the E Aeolian mode. Now, these are the same notes as G major, arranged in a minor scale starting on E. And this gives the solo a majestic, yet somewhat bittersweet, nostalgic feeling. <laughs> Now, here he does something really cool. He plays a lick based on the G minor blues scale, even though we're in the key of G major. And that makes this lick really stand out with those outside notes. It's a real head turner and it really keeps your attention on where the solo is going. The third lick starts off clearly in G major. But then he finishes that line by going back to G minor. He reverts back to E minor to end the solo with a classic palm muted descending lick. And a really cool motif with a half step bend and release. That last lick is identical to the one he plays in Heaven Can Wait. So he was probably playing with that kind of idea which is based on the minor hexatonic scale, so it would have felt natural to incorporate that kind of thing in those solos. 
For Dave Solo, they change key again, this time to A minor. Now, Dave's solo is more straightforward as he's playing in A minor throughout, but it's Dave's smooth and flowy phrasing that really stands out here. The way he seamlessly connects the different lines and... Hey, Miles, what's up? You want to say something about Dave's solo? Yeah, okay, bye. The way he seamlessly connects the different lines and the natural push-pull effect of his pacing is a masterclass in lead guitar playing. So here's the entire solo played slowly. That takes us back to the verse, pre-chorus, and chorus, and then to the outro, which is made up of two parts. First, they reprise the intro, only this time at full speed, and with Adrian's lead melody doubled an octave lower. And that gives way to what I consider to be one of the most exhilarating moments in Maiden history. So you have Steve's pumping bass line following Nichols' driving beat. And this beautiful harmonized melody that sounds like the triumph of the human spirit over everything. So Dave's part goes like this. The higher part of Dave's harmony repeats over the last part of that melody just to add a third level of harmony. And Adrian's part is the same thing, but down a third. The ritardando finish, where they slow down in the last two bars, is just a perfect ending with the way it closes the song, like the end to a good story. It actually reminds me a little bit of the instrumental Transylvania. Now, Maiden's endings tend to be very similar, and that's not for lack of imagination. The brilliance of Steve Harris is evident in the various musical and visual signatures that he created for the band. This is extremely important for a band's longevity, and ultimately for their legacy. So that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of an often overlooked song in the band's rich catalog. Let me know your thoughts, questions, and if I forgot to mention something important about the song, let's discuss that in the comments section. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and stay tuned for more licks of the beast.